Welcome to Taking Stock. I'm Amanda Lang. This week, a special edition of the show. We're in conversation with the Premier of Alberta, Danielle Smith, on the province's strong economic past, its challenge to transition from fossil fuels and its place in the national landscape. That's all ahead. But first, Alberta ended last year firing on all economic cylinders. So how is it shaping up for 2024? Here's what you need to know. Alberta is doing well. Its economy grew 2.5% in 2023. It's expected to do even better this year. Even if it doesn't, its per capita GDP is the best of the Canadian provinces. At $73,742 a person in 2022, that beats Saskatchewan, which is next highest at 64,500 and well above Ontario's 54,900. Alberta's population of 4.7 million Canadians makes it the fourth largest province in the country. It grew last year by 4.3% up to October 1st. At 22%, oil and gas extraction plus mining makes up the largest sector of its economy, followed by real estate sectors at 10.7%, manufacturing at 8.6%, and construction at 8.3%. The price of oil has a big impact on its economy. It's estimated that for every dollar up or down in the oil price, the province's revenues shift by $630 million. The government of Alberta recently introduced legislation that could make it harder to develop clean energy projects, with an estimated $11.2 billion in investments on the line. In its recent budget, the province forecasted a $367 million surplus and said it will add $2 billion to the Heritage Fund, a rainy day fund created in the 1970s that has languished in recent years. Well, coming off those strong years of economic growth, the challenge for Alberta will be how to match it, how to grow it even more, and how to maintain a prudent line on spending. That's where my conversation with Premier Danielle Smith began. We, we have to do all three. We've got to pay down debt, and there's a significant amount of debt that was racked up over some pretty difficult times that we've had in our province over the last 10 years. But we also had an early vision for our Heritage Savings Trust Fund that it would ultimately grow to be able to replace our reliance on resource revenues. That vision is stalled over the last number of decades. And so we're trying to resurrect that and bring Albertans alongside with us with a, a pretty aggressive target to get to 2050. But at the same time, because we're growing so much, we, we've seen consecutive quarters of in-migration. That means you have to build more schools, hospitals, roads, you have to hire nurses, teachers, doctors. And so we're going to balance all of those things. The main thing is we want to make sure that we're, we've got guardrails in place so that as new dollars come in, we're, we're going to be very deliberate about how we make investment in each of those three areas. You also did something that hasn't happened in a long time, and that is put money into the Alberta Heritage Fund, a kind of a savings account, if you will, uh, originally kind of conceived as oil revenue should go in here for future generations. It, it really hasn't lived up to that province promise. Is it your hope that you can kind of revive the, the original idea? Completely. I mean, when, uh, when Lockheed first started it, there were $12 billion worth of deposits. Over the years with inflation proofing, um, it took a few decades, but it got to $17 billion, which it was in when our government took over five years ago. It's It will now at the end of this year be worth $25 billion as a result of keeping the investment income in the fund and a couple of, de of deposits. And I, I have to tell you, this is not an unusual approach. I've discovered that Quebec also has a, uh, a similar type of fund that they're growing. Uh, and I have to tell you that uh, I'm a pretty competitive person, that I want to make sure that if other provinces are looking at different ways that they can diversify their revenue stream. I want to be able to keep up with that. I think we owe it to not, to the future generations of Albertans to do it. The, at the heart of this, of course, the uh, governments over time have taken money out of that, uh, have kind of spent the, the dividends of that fund because there are real uh, claims on that money. There's operating costs. How do you grow your economy in this mindset where you want to put money away for the future, where you want to stay in balance? Growth obviously is key. We might be heading into a bit of a slow period. So how are you going to achieve it? Well, just remember the, the most that that fund is generated in a given year is a billion dollars. So we've got a $73 billion budget. I, I don't think it takes too much to ask all of my ministers to, to, to just find a way to tighten up a little bit and to look for ways of generating new revenue so that we can maintain the investment income in that fund. As you know, as it grows, it's really going to be able to, to sustain its own growth. And I've seen some projections that uh, we could quite easily make it to, to 200 to 250 billion by 2050 just by keeping the investment income in the fund. So that decision's already been made. 
And if we can also have surpluses and we put a certain portion into savings, it'll just accelerate that growth. So I, I feel like we can we can do both. When it comes to how we grow our revenues, I, I think that one of the things that, that uh, we tried was reducing our corporate income tax rate. And it worked. We reduced the rate and it caused more people, more companies to invest in our province. Last year, we had um, the, one of the record amounts of, of corporate income tax revenue. We also have uh, are experimenting with different types of tax credits. Our, our film and television tax credit brought the biggest production in Canadian history, Last of Us here. We have a petrochemical incentive program, which has resulted in the investment of a number of net zero projects. Air Products is a net zero hydrogen project. Dow Chemical has a net zero petrochemical project. We're hoping that Heidelberg will make a decision on a net zero cement project. Hmm. And we're also uh, putting forward a carbon capture utilization and storage tax credit so that we hope that we can su support our oil sands companies like Pathways and being also able to achieve net zero by 2050. So those are the kind of exciting things that we've been seeing happen in the province over the last few years. And we just want to make sure that it keeps going because as you attract those kinds of businesses, you also attract the different supply chain to be able to support them. You attract the workers, which generates additional uh, personal income tax revenue. And I think that we're finally beginning to see some important diversification in the economy. There was some disappointment in the, the recent budget, uh, right? the language around that promised income tax cut, it now feels to some like it's contingent on the fiscal position, your your ability to pay for it, I suppose, uh, being in place. Is that a fair uh, assessment of kind of your thinking about it? Well, for years, we've been able to have our revenues keep up with inflation and population growth. And so um, initially going in, that was the measure that we had. But what I've observed in the last few years is our, our revenue is actually growing slower than inflation plus population growth. And so we've got to adjust for that because if you constantly increase your spending faster than your long-term revenues, that's just a recipe to go into deficit. And that was the number one uh, promise that I made to Albertans is that, is that we would run balanced budgets. So we want to make sure that as we go through this next year, we're doing some refocusing of our healthcare system. We're attempting some, some changes in how we deliver services. I've challenged my ministers to um, find in um, ministry budget savings so that they can reprioritize to higher priority projects. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to achieve that so that we can feel confident that when we deliver that tax cut, which would be about one and a half billion dollars, that we would not go into deficit to do so. So, so I, I'm hoping that Albertans are, are seeing that we're taking a measured approach because we, we know that we have to do it all, but we, we can't necessarily do it all at once. And so we've got to pace some of the decisions that we're making. And all of this, of course, against the backdrop of a population that does have affordability issues, right? Rents rising at an incredibly fast pace. Uh, we're not seeing our, our wages keeping up with that inflationary cost of living. What do you say to Albertans about, you know, where is the help for that affordability part of the equation? Our affordability uh, proposition is still very solid compared to, for instance, Vancouver or Toronto, where sadly I feel like young people would look at uh, the possibility of home ownership and just see it's not attainable. Mm -hmm. In our province, we're, we're growing two major centres, Calgary and Edmonton, but we also have a number of mid-sized cities, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, uh, Red Deer, Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, that are also high growth areas. Uh, we've got a number of, of uh, mid-sized cities, 24 of them, that are that are also growing. And so I, I think that from a home attainability point of view, we've got uh, an, an incredible uh, offering to, to Albertans and those who want to live here. We're also seeing a huge number of housing starts as well as rental starts. And so the solution is to make sure that you've got more supply coming on. And we do. So there's always that period of transition as more um, more uh, accommodation is being built. But, but I'm seeing some very positive signs on that. Still ahead, how will Alberta manage a complex transition from fossil fuels to cleaner energy? Stay with us.